So we're here in Houston, uh, Texas, uh, to, at the meeting of the Society of Hematologic Oncology. Uh, and Saturday is the session on chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which I'll be talking at. Um, in the morning, there's a session that reviews different aspects of management um, for, pa for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, first-line therapies, novel um, targeted therapies. In the afternoon, I'll be doing a session on next questions uh, for patients with CLL. Um, so we'll have a nice review of where we're at with standards of care, most likely some discussion about the new clinical trials and new data. Um, and then I'll have the opportunity to summarize sort of my thoughts on where the field's going and what do we need to focus our attention on and where is the research uh, moving towards uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Over the last year, we've had data available from several large randomized trials looking at standards of care and driving standards of care for first-line therapy for patients with CLL. All of those trials were uh, evaluating chemoimmunotherapy versus BTK inhibitor-based therapy or ibrutinib-based therapy. Um, and all those trials were positive and showed improvement in outcomes with therapy that is um, ibrutinib-based. Um, some of the trials had uh, inclusion of CD20 antibody. It didn't appear that rituximab added to the outcomes with ibrutinib. Um, the Illuminate trial looked at ibrutinib plus obinutuzumab, there wasn't a monotherapy comparator arm. Nevertheless, all of those studies showed improved outcomes with ibrutinib-based therapy over chemoimmunotherapy, and I think with that data, we're sort of ushering out the era of chemoimmunotherapy and ushering in standard of care with first-line treatment with ibrutinib-based therapy or BTK inhibitor-based um, therapy. So the question is, where are we going next with our frontline therapies? Uh, more recently, the CLL14 trial read out. The CLL14 trial was a trial done by the German CLL study group. It compared chemoimmunotherapy, chlorambucil obinutuzumab, versus venetoclax-based therapy with venetoclax obinutuzumab. And that trial was positive, showing improved outcomes with venetoclax-based first-line therapy. Um, and patients with venetoclax-based therapy have excellent debulking of their disease, and many of them achieve an MRD negative remission. That's fixed duration treatment with venetoclax, one year of treatment with venetoclax, and then patients stop. So with the advent of venetoclax, which is a BCL2 small molecule inhibitor, we are bringing back a discussion about fixed duration treatment with small molecule inhibitor-based therapy so that patients can achieve a deep remission and then come off treatment. Our newer clinical trials and trials that we've reported on have been with combinations of small molecule inhibitors, no chemotherapy. Um, and those trials were seeing very, very high response rates, very high MRD negative rates. Um, and so the next questions in that regard are, what's the percentage of patients who can achieve a deep remission, who we can achieve MRD negative status for, how long do we need to treat patients? Is there variable duration that patients need to be treated in order to achieve a best response? How long do the remissions last? And what does the disease look like when the disease returns? And how do we manage those patients with retreatment? Um, just because they've had prior small molecule inhibitor-based therapy and they've relapsed expectedly several years later does not mean that they're not going to respond to retreatment. So we need to study and to learn about how do we retreat those patients. Do we retreat them with BTK monotherapy or with combinations or with BCL2, small molecule targeted um, therapy, uh, et cetera. That discussion is also being brought into the relapsed setting. So for patients who have relapsed disease, management of relapsed disease and using combinations of small molecule inhibitors is the direction that, we're, that we've gone in and we're generating data with. A couple other areas that are highlighted for, the, for a need for a further study and evaluation are Richter's transformation. So we're still seeing patients develop Richter's transformation, even in the era of small molecule inhibitor-based therapy. Those patients have very aggressive disease, and management for Richter's transformation is still a challenge. Patients are developing, um, that are having excellent disease control, but are developing second cancers. 
And we're entering an era where it's more common for patients not to die of their CLL, but to die of infections or die of second cancers. So having an understanding of why patients with CLL are predisposed to develop second cancers, developing strategies to monitor and screen for those cancers is important, and management for those second cancers, I think, is also very important, as is management of infection. Um, and preventing um, morbidity and mortality from infection-related causes. So we have made tremendous progress in management and treatment for patients with CLL over the last several years. There still are areas that we have progress to make, and certainly patients with CLL have, are doing better now than they ever have, but still have some unmet needs uh, for work.